No matter how big your local church is, it remains a household of faith. No matter how small your church may be, it remains a household of faith. And Solomon built his own house. But from Solomon's house, there was an ascent, there was a staircase that went up to the temple. And whilst we are building our own local church, we're putting all the programs in place. And yes, I'm the pastor of a local church. We must build something bigger. Because God wants to see the corporate temple being formed. Now, this is something that will change. It will change the status quo of the church in every city. So, if Jesus had to speak, when letters were written, Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, to the church at Galatia, to the church at Philippi. Those were physical jurisdictions. So if Jesus has to speak, he'll speak to the church at Smyrna in the book of Revelation, to the church at Laodicea. And I want all of us, as the months go by, to give more support to the building of the church in the city because God speaks to that, to that body, to the church in the city. When the church in every city is formed, even in, in an area like Santon, God will speak to the church at Santon. Okay, and I don't know what God will say to us, how big a deal we've made of mammon, but maybe we'll deal with that on another day. The things that I've been sharing are very, very important in the eternal scheme of things. If you get this right, if you begin to flesh out the word of the Lord that we are teaching now, and you build up your defense mechanisms, you will find yourself being bulletproof for the tsunamis that are taking place in the earth. So we're speaking of building our defense system. And the Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 22, Moses is giving an instruction to God's people, speaking to them about what they should do when they enter the promised land. And he says in Deuteronomy 22, 8, When you build a new house, you shall make a parapet for your roof that you may not bring guilt or bloodshed on your household if anyone falls from it. Now a parapet is a low protective wall or a protective wall along the edge of a raised structure. It is something serving as a defense or a safeguard. And we are building a parapet. We are building defense systems. In the Netherlands, they have the Delta Works, 640 kilometers of wall that's built as a protective edge so that the waters do not enter into the city. Same with the Thames River. They have walls. And if you don't have your walls built, if you don't have your parapet built, you will fall. You will fall into temptation. The other word used to describe a parapet is a bulwark. It's a safeguard. Paul wrote to Timothy and speaks, to, tells Timothy that, that the man of God should not be a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. He also says to Timothy, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. James wrote and said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into trials. Now, as a spiritual house, we must ensure that we build our parapet because we are God's house. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6 says, we are God's house. Job had a protective edge. Satan answered and said in Job 1 and verse 9, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him? What did the hedge do for Job? The hedge prospered him. The hedge protected protected him, the hedge blessed Job. So you've got to make sure that you build your hedge. Now we've come from a season where lots of people don't like to take personal responsibility for their faith. You think that you come to church, pastor will lay hands, he's the man, he's the man of power for the hour, he'll just lay his hands, I'll fall down, and tomorrow I'll go to work and I'll win the lotto. And my marriage will abracadabra everything will fall into place i got news for you that is a superstitious sick mentality that has gripped the church i believe in prayer 
But if you don't do your part, God will send rain from heaven. But if you got no seed in the ground, don't expect fruit in a harvest. In Matthew 21 verse 33, Jesus spoke and said, Hear another parable. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set an hedge around it. In Matthew 23, the landowner plants a vineyard and the vineyard is the church. And what does he do? He sets a hedge around the vineyard. We are the vineyard of God and you must make sure that the hedge is fortified. We must know our defense systems. Why? So you don't fall off the balcony. Many times we fall into sin. We fall because the edge is broken and you have not taken time to build the parapet. Here's a nice verse, Ecclesiastes 10.8. He that digs a pit shall fall into it. And whoever breaks an edge, a serpent shall bite him. Whoever breaks the edge, a serpent shall bite him. So don't curse and bind and loose and do all the stuff. You broke the edge. And because you broke the edge, the serpent, you've given, you've given license to the serpent to enter your territory and jurisdiction. God is our defense and he is our fortress. Psalm 31, in you, O Lord, I put my trust. Bow down your ear to me. Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense. Now, our trust is in God. And he is our defense against the plans of the enemy. But I've been putting practical daily activities in place so that your edge remains strong and solid. As a son of God, you are a builder. In fact, son the word son and the word build in the original Hebrew are so intrinsically linked. Unless the Lord builds the house. Psalm 127. The word build is the word bana. And from the word bana you derive the word ben. So by nature you should be a builder. And what should you do? You must construct parapets. So that you do not fall into the snare of the enemy. The Bible says in Isaiah 59.19 when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. You've got to know how to raise up the standard. How do you build your parapet? Is by prayers, by proclamations, by decrees and declarations. In Psalm chapter 2, David says, I will declare the decree of the Lord. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give to you the, give the nations for your inheritance. You've got to know how to declare God is my father. I am his son. How do you build your parapet? Is by prayers, by proclamations, by decrees and declarations. In Psalm chapter 2, David says, I will declare the decree of the Lord. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give to you the, give the nations for your inheritance. You've got to know how to declare, God is my father. I am his son. When you wake up every morning, you've got to remind yourself because you're going into a chaotic environment. You've got to say, God is my father and I am his son. You've got to know how to make pronouncements over your family. Because you realize Psalm 18.21 says, Death and life lie in the power of the tongue. So you've got to know that as a son of God, your tongue carries death and it carries life. Elijah said in 1 Kings 17, There will not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. What pronouncements and proclamations are you making over your family, over your home, over your marriage? I know we're living in South Africa and we don't have water some days and we don't have electricity. But are we making pronouncements and proclamations over our country? 1 Chronicles 16 verse 23 says, Sing to the Lord all the earth, proclaim the good news of his salvation day by day. 
proclaim the good news of his salvation day by day. I know things are not perfect. I know things are not where they should be. But I will proclaim the good news of his salvation. When you, when you arise in the morning, make this pronouncement that God is your shield. Psalm 3 and verse 3 says, But you, O Lord, are a shield for me. You are the lifter of my head. You are my glory and the lifter of my head. How many of you found your head at times sagging and depressing thoughts get a hold of you? We live in a society that is riddled with depression. It's becoming, it's becoming the new pandemic. But if you know how to say, you are the lifter of my head. Come on, you've got to make that declaration. And whilst we trust in psychiatry and psychology, I can tell you those pronouncements are so important when you lay your hands on your children. Say, you are the lifter, you are my glory. Sometimes you are, your body is aching and your body is failing. You can sing Psalm 107 where it says, he sent his word and healed our disease. See, the problem is, we have the tools at our disposal, but we are not using it. We are not using it. How about this? From one generation to another generation, Psalm 145 says, One generation shall praise your works to another. I am so concerned about the next generation that's coming up. You know what's been happening? You know what's happening? The spiritual DNA is getting weaker from one generation to the next generation. It's not getting stronger. And we have to be deliberate if, in, in our building patterns. And we've got to declare it. We've got to speak life. We've got to speak that our young men will become mighty apostles and prophets. How do you build your parapet? Number one pronouncement. Secondly, you have to overcome laziness and apathy. You know, we become apathetic and lazy. And what happens when you are in this apathetic state? Your defense systems drop. And prosperity, it's a sad thing. But prosperity is one of the key factors that leads to a diminished passion for the Lord. Prosperity, not poverty, is your greatest test. You want to test a man's character? Prosperity is the true test of a man's character. So when you, when you pray for wealth, you better be ready to give it away because it will control you. Proverbs 24 says, I went by the field of a lazy man and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding. And there it was, all overgrown with thorns. The, its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. And when I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. So shall your poverty come like a prowler. You see, the stone wall is broken. And you think you can rest and take it easy. And you might think poverty is only when it comes to currency or, or money. Poverty can be spiritual poverty. You can be spiritually impoverished and not know it. This is when you have a lack of interest in the things of God, a lack of enthusiasm, a lack of prayer, a lack of interest in fellowship. There's a dullness. There's a deafness. There's an impenitence. When you hear God's word, does it resonate within your being to repent and align yourself? Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 12 to 14. Lest, watch this, watch Watch what happens in the apathetic state that we find ourselves in and we have an abundance of worldly goods. And the abundance of worldly goods is your test. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and you dwell in them. What, what happens now? Verse 13. And when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied and all that you have is multiplied. Verse 14. When your heart is lifted up, then the key part is, and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The abundance of worldly goods can do that can place you in an apathetic state. 
you forget the Lord your God. When you are in an apathetic state, your defense systems drop and then you, you have an intolerance to sound doctrine. The Bible says in 2 Timothy verse four, chapter 4, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. People love words that will tickle their ears. When you're in an apathetic state, you find no pleasure in the word of God. Jeremiah 6 and verse 10 says, To whom shall I speak and give warning? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. In fact, the NIV says, the word is offensive to them. This is what we have. We have a generation that is rebellious. Rebellious to the word of God. Ezekiel 12, the word of the Lord came to him saying, Son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house. They have eyes to see and don't see. They have ears to hear and hear not. For they are a rebellious house. You are in an apathetic state. This is how your defense system drops. When you are preoccupied with yourself. In Matthew 22, there was an invitation in verse 5 made for those to come to the, uh, for, for people to come to the wedding feast. And many made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm and another to his merchandise or another to his business. We live in a self-consumed generation. And selfish preoccupation will leave no time for spiritual affairs or the things of God. Paul made it clear that those who have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. There is a disease that, I call it a disease because that's what it is that the American Psychiatric Association has, um, has put out as selfitis. Selfie is a well-known word in the modern world of social media. It is hard to find people in the world who use social media but never use selfies. Selfitis is an obsessive compulsive desire to take photos by oneself and post them on social media. Example, on Facebook, to make up for the lack of self-esteem. The American Psychiatric Association has all officially confirmed that taking selfies is a mental disorder. This is not me now. This is, this is professionals. You get borderline self -itis. This is taking photos by oneself at least three times a day without posting them on social media. Borderline. Then you get acute selfitis. Taking photos by oneself at least three times a day and posting those on social media. Then you get chronic selfitis. Taking photos by oneself more than six times a day and posting those on social media. A person with chronic selfitis generally uses social media around the clock and posts selfies on social media frequently. Selfitis Listen, it's in the psychiatric association. Selfitis is closely related to narcissism. That is excessive interest or admiration of oneself. It has been observed that people with lots of Facebook friends or fans are most likely to become narcissists. They may, they may act selfishly. They may act unruly. They have an inability to take criticism. Instead of listening to respond, they listen to dismiss. They refuse to take responsibility. They tend to blame others when things go wrong. A selfie is a great tool. And people are always looking to express themselves differently from others. A selfie is a great tool for this purpose. Research has shown that people who are isolated from family and society are constantly on the lookout uh, for smartphones and they are the ones who use selfies frequently. If you are a son of God, you don't live for yourself anymore. You know, everything in this world is moving towards
secular humanism. In the pre-modern era, God was at the center of all things. In the post-modern era, or in the modern era, man was at the center. But in the post-modern era, there's no center. People today have made themselves bigger than God. And I want to say to us today, if you're a son of God, you will even give up me time because all time is his time. I don't live for myself. I, I actually, for you died and your life is hidden in Christ. You know what that means? You died and your life is hidden in Christ. And you've got to see the potency of living in secrecy. You've got to see the, the father is in secret. No, to hide yourself, go into your room, close the door, be in secret. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. The treasure is locked up in the vessel. It's in secret. Apathetic people are thankless people. Apathetic people are haughty. Apathetic people are, are yoked to the world. Now, when you are in a lazy state, you are full of excuses. The Bible says in Proverbs 22.13, the lazy man says, there's a lion outside. I shall be slain in the streets. When you are in a, in a lazy or apathetic state, you will not work in tough conditions. In fact, you will beg. Proverbs says this in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 4. The lazy man will not plow in winter. He will beg during harvest. Here's an audit that you need to do of yourself. Have we become lazy? In certain areas of our lives. You need to ask yourself. Have you become lazy in your marriage? Have you become lazy in your devotional life? Have you become lazy with your health? Most of us. We, 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 we take it for granted. Have we become lazy with our finances? The management and stewardship of our finances. Have you become lazy with your mind? As a man thinks, so is he. What do you meditate on? Are you neutralizing thoughts in your minds that are against God and his word? Is there thought control? When there is apathy and laziness, the stone wall is broken down and the enemy comes in. You see, you receive instructions. And sometimes we can become familiar with the word of the Lord and with instructions that are given to us and we can be in an apathetic state. In 2 Kings 13, Elisha gave the instruction to Joash. He said, I want you to take the arrow and, and hit it onto the ground. But Joash did it in an apathetic state. And he didn't finish well. Here's a very key part of building your parapet. The next part is relationships. You must maintain relationships that can push and propel us. You are the average of the four people you spend time with. He who walks with wise men will be wise. Proverbs 13.20 But the companion of fools will be destroyed. The example is King Rehoboam. King Rehoboam was the son of King Solomon. He was the grandson of David. And when he came into kingship, he, he, he was taking counsel from the elders. And he didn't like what the elders said. So what did Rehoboam do? He rejected the advice which the elders had given him and he consulted the young men whom he had grown up with. Sometimes the, the listen to me, when elders give you advice, you don't like to take it. Because no, these are old school people. These are old fashioned people. What do they know? And the kingdom was torn. You know what actually happened? Rehoboam lost dominion. You lose dominion, rulership, authority on the earth when you walk with youthful people, immature people. Look at Samson. Samson had a great prophetic destiny, but his prophetic destiny was aborted because he played with the Philistines. Now listen to me very carefully. The Philistine is one of the best pictures you will find of the flesh. Goliath was his height was six cubits, and the number six speaks of uh, of man and the flesh. He was a Philistine. What did Samson do? 
he began to speak riddles to the Philistines. You have a whole generation like Samson that are birthed miraculously. That have prophetic destiny to deliver God's people. But you have a relationship with the Philistine. You have a relationship with fleshly carnal indulgences. Sin will take you further than you want to go. And make you pay more than you're willing to. There's relationships that you must move away from. Acquaintances. You got acquaintances. Good acquaintances. There are people who are your friends, but they're only friends for the good times. Bri, Vors. You, you have friends who will be with you for the good times. But you don't have covenantal relationships. One of the, you've got to move, you, you've got to gravitate. You've got to start at the bottom of acquaintances. You've got to move past friendships. You've got to move past courtships. You've got to come to covenantal relationships. God is not a God of just friendships. God is a God of covenant. A covenant is a solemn vow between two people and God. But that's just not in marriage. What about being part of a covenantal community? What about being in covenant with the servant of the Lord? As you engage covenantally, God shows up. Elisha received a double portion because he was not walking contractually with Elijah. He had a covenant. Ruth did not birth the, the seed that would ultimately bring forth the Christ. She just haphazardly, she walked with Naomi. Where you go, I will go. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. We have a generation that lives uncovenantally. What generation is this called? It's called the Moabite generation. Moab was born through an incestuous relationship between Lot and his daughter. The name Moab means what father? Because Moab didn't know whether his father was his father or his grandfather. And when you come into a city like Johannesburg, you can become a Moabite. Where people say, what father? I'm a self-made man. You've seen my car, you've seen my house. Why do I need the grace of Father? And we, and we live isolated, independent lives. We don't have the bulwark. We don't have the parapet. See, people in your life will be walls to you. We must choose relationships carefully. Proverbs twelve twenty six says, The righteous should, should choose his friends carefully. The next way to build your parapet and your defense system. The next way is through a culture. We call it an apostolic culture. Culture. What is your system of habits? Culture, simply defined, is a system of habits. What are your... If I had to come into your house... And I've had to sit in your house for five days. What will be different from you and everyone else who's of this world? The Bible says in Acts 2.42, they continued steadfastly. The word steadfast is very key. Without wavering, without faltering. They continued in apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and in prayers. They did not continue in motivational speaking. You gotta know doctrine is a very difficult thing, but you gotta know it because doctrine will develop your character. It'll help you overcome the flesh. They continued in apostles' doctrine. These are the four pillars you must install into your home. Now watch what happens when that takes place. Acts 2.42. Now we're gonna read 2.43. 2.43 says, then fear came upon every soul. That wasn't terror. That was the reverential awe of God. What? Listen to me. Fear came upon. That means your your children and even us, reverential awe for God will come to us. When you don't have the culture installed, you won't have the fear of the Lord. Uh, I'm telling you something. When you have the reverential awe, the fear of the Lord is the beginning. You know what the beginning means? It is the root, the source, and the foundation of wisdom. Wisdom builds the house. Fear came upon every. We need our children to have the fear of the Lord. Then next verse. 
Verse 44, now all who believed were together. That means you'll have oneness. Verse 46, they continued daily. That means they were steadfast. It also says in verse 46, they ate their food with gladness. It doesn't say they ate lobsters and crayfish. No, it just says they ate their food. It could have been the most basic meal, but they had gladness. They didn't have happiness. Gladness was a result of a culture that was installed. You've got to know how to bring it home. Put it there. And fathers, you've got to be disciplined. Whatever you are going through, you'll have gladness. You'll have sustained joy despite the circumstance. That's gladness. And the Bible says in verse 47, Praising God and having favor with all the people. What was the result of the culture? Favor. How do you build your parapet? You build your parapet by positioning yourself under grace. Come under grace and know how to receive grace and you will be protected. Stay within the radius and sphere of grace and you will be protected. There was a man in the Bible, his name was Nabal. Nabal was a very wealthy man. But when David and his men were in the field, they protected all of Nabal's assets. But Nabal being a foolish man, uh, when David's men asked for food, he said, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away from, from, from their master. Shall I take my bread and water and meat and give it to them who I don't know? Nabal did not know how to receive grace. The result was, he lost his life. Now here's the contrast Nabal with a Shunammite woman. In 2 Kings chapter 4, in 2 Kings chapter 4, this was the Shunammite woman. She said to her husband, look now, I know this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. Let us make a small upper room on the wall. We put a bed, we put a chair, we put a table, we put a lampstand. So whenever he comes, he can turn into us. What this woman did, she took the carrier of grace, Elisha, and she placed him in the upper room. A lot of people don't like to take the servant of the Lord and prepare an upper room for him. You like to put him in a basement. But you know what? Anointing flows from the top to the bottom. The gravitational flow of anointing is top down. It can never be bottom up. So what she did, as she put him on the top, the anointing was flowing. It was flowing. Here was a barren woman. Here was a woman whose womb was not producing. But because she positioned grace, she began to produce. That became a parapet. One of the ways to position is to receive the instructions that come from a father. People today don't like to obey instructions. Obedience is costly. Disobedience is more costly. If I say to you, don't go down this road. Don't go down the road. (laughs) Which father will give instructions to their children that will cause them harm? Because we live in a rebellious culture, we resist authority. And authority that God has placed on the earth is never restrictive. It is always protective. 